Some of you have ordered sake in advance, some of you have not, but whether you have sake in front of you or not, I promise this next section of our program is going to be fun and quite informative. We have invited Sachko from Tipsy to lead our sake tasting portion of our event. Um, I'd like to introduce Sachko a little bit. Um, Sachko is a bilingual, bicultural sake educator native to Seattle, Washington. It is actually during her six year stint in Boston studying and working in architecture that she solidified her dream of being involved in sake education. So Sachiko says that this has been a serendipitous encounter to take part in this special event tonight. Sachiko is a WSET sake educator and an official lecturer by Sake Service Institute and has taught numerous certification courses for sake and shochu through her previous job as lead instructor at Sake School of America. This year, she joined the largest online sake retail shop, Tipsy, who make delivering sake to your door for this event possible. Tipsy's mission is to spread the love of sake and make this beautiful beverage accessible to as many people as possible in the United States. Sachiko-san, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Yuko-san. <laughs> Thank you for having us. My name is Sachiko. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. And right now is a great time to grab um, our first bottle, the Dasai. If you have the sake um, that you have been chilling in the fridge, right now is a great time to bring out actually all three of the bottles, just because right after um, taking it out of the fridge can be a little bit too cold sometimes. And um, raising the temperature just to even a few degrees um, helps you taste the flavors a little bit easier. So please go grab your um, your sake is out of the fridge right now. If you haven't already, um, I have it already out. My default glass for tasting it in is a uh, white wine glass, but you can do a more kind of traditional sake cup. This is called a jamame with the, not a bullseye, but it's um, well, very close to a bullseye, but they call it jamame, which is a snake's eye. Um, that helps you see the colors in it. Or, you know, whatever you feel like, really. But please go grab it uh, when you have a chance while I start to share my screen and we can talk about sake. I, I'd like to, I hate to have people wait for a kampai. Uh -huh. <laughs> and if you'd like to unmute your yourself and ask questions as I go, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, this is the, the fun part. Congratulations to the people that received the awards. I was, um, I was able to tune in and was very touched by it as well. I know Boston with like the longest history um, with Japan. I was so inspired when I was living there. And I really, really miss it. I miss Boston. So thank you for this opportunity. So we are Tipsy. Um, it's T-I-P-P-S-Y. And it's a startup company. We are, our mission is to make every single sake that is available in America available for people to order online so that you can get it at your door. With COVID, but even without COVID as well, it really is a time for sake to break away from just being enjoyed at Japanese restaurants and to be enjoyed at home because there's such a huge versatility and there's so much to enjoy from every single sake that um, I have learned about and I still have a long way to go. So in this short session, we're gonna talk about what sake is briefly, what ingredients it's made out of. Um, the brewing process is a very complicated, complicated one, but we'll touch on like all the details. Um, maybe I could just brush through that. Um, that's something that us like sake geeks learn about in certification courses and, and really get into because every single decision that's made in the brewing process, and we call it brewing, like 
beer rather than winery because it's made from a grain and it's closer to beer process. Um, so it makes me think about like going to Sam Adams and there's actually a sake brewer that was working at Sam Adams for eight years and that's been my first sake brewery experience when I lived in Boston because that's when I started pursuing this career. Um, we talk about main categories in sake so that you can start to identify which sake is your style. So you can start looking at it, you know, either on the Tipsy website or when you walk into the grocery store. I was really inspired um, when I lived in Boston because I already had a sake education. I worked as a server in Seattle throughout my college years um, and had it was a dedicated drinker. But I realized that um, sake was, it was actually really hard to get some of the sake that I really liked. So that inspired me into this career of understanding more about it and being able to talk about it more so that more people can enjoy it. We're going to talk about how to taste. Honestly, you don't need a lesson on how to taste sake. You just need to be able to enjoy it. Um, I don't find too many people, like occasionally there's people that um, can't drink, of course, um, or is, sake is not their preferred drink and it's nothing to be forced. Um, but if you have a taste for it, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and even if you don't, like some of my friends that don't drink sake, they still enjoy hearing about it because of the history and the cultural aspects that you learn from it. Um, drinking etiquette, a lot of people are interested in the drinking etiquette. And I think that's just um, from respect for the culture, which I really appreciate, but honestly, there's no rules. Um, it's, it is about that situation, who you're enjoying it. And the most important thing is to enjoy it with others. Um, that's what sake is about. I think that's what Japanese culture is about. It's about the generosity and sharing with others. Um, and then we go into the tasting. So I'm gonna try to do the first six bullet points really quick so we can go into the tasting. So what is sake? There is actually like 2000 year history of alcohol being made in Japan. Um, also with rice, there's a um, written record of sake being made from about the eighth century uh, from rice. It is the it is Japan's national beverage called kokushu. Um, also shochu, which is a distilled beverage, is also kokushu. So it's sort of protected. Um, it is their beverage. This really sad thing is that um, it is a dying art. So a lot of breweries even today are closing down. It's very, very difficult to sustain. It's very, very labor intensive. Um, it's something that the, the country wants to protect, but we're having a hard time. Um, so every little purchase, every little sip counts and the appreciation does count um, to help preserve that art. Uh, it's starting to get really recognized internationally. So US market is the largest uh, export in the world and we are growing by 200% in, you know, in the last five years. But it's still about four to 5% of the entire production of Japan. So um, it's an interesting thing. We get all the premium sake, which is we're really lucky to have. And uh, we're doing a great job. So right now is a really good time to get involved in sake because we're getting new products and it's just exciting things happening. Hot sake in the US um, is what permeated, I think through the 70s and 80s and even the 90s or even today, um, college students is often introduced to it as hot sake that is something that you shoot, um, probably because you get it in like a little, little cup like this and it seems like it's something that you should shoot. Um, although premium sake really should be sipped and enjoyed because there's so many nuances that you can enjoy like on your tongue and as the temperature changes and there's, you know, um, 
kind of gestures that you you get while you're uh, enjoying sake and there's just so much more to it so um, it's almost or like uh, sad to um, to just shoot it and drink it as a beverage just to just to get the buzz off of but you will get a buzz because it is about usually about 15 to 17 percent alcohol which is a little bit higher than wine and that's why it's served in a smaller vessel there's four main ingredients in sake. Water is really, really important. It's actually 80% of sake is all water. And every brewery, historical or, you know, some of these breweries are like 16th generation. And they're placed strategically in the best water source. So most all of them are using well water or underwater, underwater river water. There are a few in Tokyo that uses um, filtered water. So like the, um, the breweries in America, they generally have filtered water, which is fun. You can still make amazing sake with filtered water now that we have the, the research um, to understand what minerals are important. But traditionally in Japan, all the breweries were placed where the best water source was. So you'll find it in rural areas. There's often hot springs. Um, that's why it's nice visiting those places. And uh, water in Japan is very soft. Very soft meaning just less minerals and calcium. Um, rice is very important, of course. There's different varietals and sake rice. Um, and if you didn't know, there's sake rice versus table rice. So eating rice is different from sake rice and sake rice is at least three times as much uh, in price. And the kernels are about 30% larger. You'll start to notice different rice strains like Yamada Nishiki, Gohyaku Mangoku, uh, Miyama Nishiki, Omachi. Those are the main four that you might encounter and some others too. And there's prefectural, prefecturally um, uh, famous rice and it, that's also an up and coming kind of thing. Every, every year there's new rice strains being developed. Um, it's not as distinctive to wine. Like if you are drinking Riesling, you're going to get Riesling characters. If you did a blind tasting, you could probably taste those characters. It's not as um, distinct for Japanese sake because the hand of the brewer and the decisions that they make in the brewing process really affects the outcome. But rice is important. Rice is, uh, it's only made with rice. These are the four main ingredients. You can't have anything else legally for uh, premium sake. Rice koji. So uh, my family has lived in the States for the last 30 years or so, and my mother makes miso at home, uh, miso paste at home, and there's rice koji that you can buy on Amazon and at grocery stores. You could probably go to H Mart and buy the, um, buy the, the rice koji there, um, but it's moldy rice. This is a national mold it, that converts the starch into sugars. So if you have this rice koji, you just tasted it um, for fun. It's a little bit sweet. It's, that's the, the starch to sugar conversion that you, you actually really need in sake to make alcohol from a grain, which is rice. And then yeast is a microorganism and the yeast is the sugar to alcohol conversion. What's cool about the yeast is that Yeast development, there's thousands of yeasts. You know, yeast it lives in the air. Um, it's what spoils some things, but it also ferments things. So sake is a fermented beverage, just like kombucha or, um, or beer, wine. Um, but the yeast and sake gives it the aroma. So we're gonna try three different sake today that has a very highly polished rice. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, in a little, few more slides, um, and they treat, they select the yeast for it to give like 
an apple aroma or a banana type or more bold type. So this is a really um, recent development that in the last 40 years and even, even more so in the last five years or 10 years, there's flower yeast. Um, we just started incorporating a, a new product at Tipsy is a peach sake that uses peach yeast. They're the only ones that use a peach yeast to make sake as a base. I was really, um, it was really fun to learn about that. But those are the four ingredients. There's nothing added. So if you have gluten-free friends, friends that you know want to remain gluten-free, it's a gluten-free product. Um, there's nothing, there's no sulfites. There's no like chemicals added. They just heat up, heat up the sake to pasteurize it, meaning killing the enzymes, killing the microorganisms that are in there that made that sake so that you can store it at room temperature. You know, that's why they have room temperature stored sake at the grocery store. So that's the four ingredients, it's just made from rice, water, koji, and yeast. Let me know if you have any questions again, like I don't mind being interrupted if there's, um, it's kind of hard for me to keep an eye on the chat, but if you can just unmute yourself and barge in, I would appreciate that. The brewing process, if you look at it like this, it, it may look a little complicated um, and it is. <laughs> it's complicated because, oops, sorry. Can you see my cursor here? Every little step matters and every little decision that the brewer makes for sake is going to end up in a different product. So rice polishing rice is polished kind of like stones. It takes a very long time to polish these and they're like perfect pearls at the end and then it's um, rested for a little bit before being soaked and washed. This is like, you know, washing rice at home, which is the same. And they, the water gets a little milky. If you wash your face with that, because it has a little bit of rice powder, that's really like good for your skin. Um, you steam the rice. And then it goes to two different processes. So, portion of the steam rice becomes koji, the moldy rice that I was talking about. And that's the same as a base for, for miso and soy sauce and shochu. So every one of those things goes through the same process of making koji. And koji can be made from, uh, in the case of miso paste, it can be made from um, barley or uh, other things. It doesn't have to be rice. rice. Rice koji is actually the most meticulous in it takes the most effort and um, time and skill. Let's go, we have a question. Um, oh, yes, yes. Are there sake breweries in the United States? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I worked at one in Seattle uh, when I started to pursue this dream of um, working in sake. There are about 20 or so. Um, the one that was in Boston called Dovetail Sake closed down a few years ago, but the same brewer that I mentioned that um, worked at Sam Adams for a long time um, has been partnering with Cambridge Brewing Company, and he just launched his new brewery called Farthest, Farthest Star Sake, Todd Bellamy is the name of the guy. He's an American, you know, he looks like an American, but once you start talking to him, he reads and writes Japanese and he's way more Japanese inside than I am. So please seek them out. Um, Cambridge Brewing Company hosted a dovetail sake back then and they had hybrids with beer and um, it was a really cool collaboration. But there, another notable one might be Brooklyn Kuda in Brooklyn, um, so if you ever visit New York, um, please go visit them. There are about 20 craft sake breweries, craft meaning like very, very small. The one I worked at was like a garage size. Um, and they are made by just super passionate people, often from beer background because it's, we have, there's a similar brewing process, um, but there's plenty. 
So if you have any questions, if you have any questions after this too, you can email us at tipsy or sachiko at tipsysake.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions because um, these are really cool questions that um, I may not be able to answer all of it in this session. But yeah, thank you for the question. And Sachiko, these uh, US brewers, are they using Japanese uh, sake rice or are they American sake rice? So, a common sake rice um, is from California called Cal Rose. However, it comes from the same father strain of Yamada Nishiki. So Yamada Nishiki is the most famous sake rice used in sake making. It's won so many competitions um, and it's called the king of sake rice. And the father is a Tankang Wataripune. So the father strain crossed the ocean, got married to an American sake rice, or, you know, we don't know if it's a sake rice or a table rice, the mother, um, but throughout the generations um, has become a table rice, a common table rice in California. And that is often used for brewing. We actually also have a Yamada Nishiki that's grown in Arkansas and in California and another really famous um, strain called Omachi that was recently just this year or last year um, was harvested in Arkansas as well. So because there's a booming, uh, quietly booming for the sake, sake geeks, um, sake brewing industry in North America, there has been demand for things like Yamada Nishiki, which is a sake rice strain, Omachi, another sake rice strain in America. And I love that story because, you know, I'm like between first and second generation Japanese American. And I think of Cal Rose as being like fifth generation <laughs> Japanese American. And I think that um, the sake that they make is delicious. All right, thank you for the question. I'm gonna keep going on this brewing process because um, I'm like making you wait for the first sip. So after koji is made, you also have um, the steamed rice and you mix everything with the yeast and the steamed rice and the koji um, to make it start to ferment. So this is the yeasty bubbly mash that you have. And you do it in a very slow process. Um, again, sake is fermented, none of the parts in sake making is wasted. So every polished portion, the powder from the sake, the brown part is used for um, pickling, like nuka. Sometimes when you get to the very, very core, it's used for cosmetics or for pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical use. And in the middle, um, it is used for confectionaries and also sembe, so rice crackers. Um, some for cattle feed as well. So it's a very, very clean process. Like I said, there's no chemicals used other than heat, very minimal chemical, if any. So um, all the water, the pristine water that's being used for brewing just seeps into the, the ground and it is a very natural process. Um, so you have this yeasty fermentation mash and then you basically put it in bags and squeeze it out. So that's the separation of the uh, solids and the liquids. Um, we don't have one that's cloudy for this tasting, but sometimes you see sake that's cloudy. The reason why it's cloudy is because the bags that they use have bigger holes in them to let some of the rice particles escape when they squeeze it out. So they take most of the solid out, but they leave some of the solids in the liquid and that's called a nigori. Those are excellent for matching a lot of different food. Um, anything from sweet to spicy it is pretty amazing, versatile um, sake that's very popular in, in America. Um, the sake lees that are pressed out is also used for culinary use. Um, it's excellent for fermenting black cod, um, meats, vegetables, things like that. It's also amazing in your bath for your skin again, and also for your facial packs. If anybody um, likes the, uh, the cosmetic 
line that I can't afford called uh, SK2 that you see at airports and things like that. That is an acronym from sake kasu. That's what remains after making sake. And sake brewers are known to have um, really clean hands, like really beautiful hands because all the polishing and it's really good for you. Anyway, so then there's different things like charcoal filtration, there's fining, they do this in wine too. They, they put charcoal in there, sometimes like collagen. Um, back in the days, it was like pork collagen and things like that, or egg whites. Um, that would attach to the different particles that you don't want in your sake and then you filter that out. There's heat pasteurization. There's um, first and second heat pasteurization. Again, that's just killing the enzymes that's responsible for aging the product. So you don't want those in the bottle with the sake because it'll keep aging it and it might turn the color, it might change the flavor. So to make it um, shelf stable, and to make it you know, clean and nice to your door, they pasteurize it twice. That's typically the process uh, for sake. So I'm gonna keep going here. So this is, uh, if you see in the photo here, this is polished rice. Um, this is brown rice on the, on the top left, um, which would be 100% polished um, rice. On the right, this is about 70%. So that means 30% of the outside is carved away. You see how every single one is kind of perfect? That's because they actually have sieves to remove some of the, the broken ones and every single one is like a perfect pearl. And they do that before they start brewing. Um, so you can imagine the, the amount of um, labor that goes into this. But the different polish ratio will determine the different grades of sake. So this is like a matrix. There's a junmai type on this right-hand side. Junmai means pure rice. You can't have the word junmai on that bottle if you add any brewer's alcohol. So if it says junmai, there's no brewer's alcohol added. If it doesn't say gin wine, there's going to have brewer's alcohol added. And this is for all premium sake. We don't get it that much um, non-premium sake. So you can just go by this rule for like 90, more than 90% of what you see at the grocery store. Um, cooking sake, I wouldn't uh, put in that category, but so sometimes cooking sake is gin wine as well. Um, and then depending on how highly it's polished, 70%, 60%, or 50%, you, can, you are allowed to have a label. So if it's 50% or less, then you're able to have the word Daikinjo on it. Believe it or not, because Japanese people are crazy about their craft and have to go to the extreme, there is a 1% polish ratio sake. That means 99% of the outside is polished away. And I've seen these kernels on my hand, they are tiny <laughs> and it's ridiculous and it takes two months to polish because you have to do it very, very slow. Believe it or not, there's actually a 0% polish as well because they actually round down but anyway, even if it's 0% polish, you can still call it a daikinjo. You don't have to call it a daikinjo. It's that just that you can. But I think we all know from this Japanese culture, being exposed to Japanese culture, like humility is a thing. And uh, the more humble you are about it, it, there's like a beauty to it. So even if it's 60%, you don't have to call it a ginjo, even though you're allowed to call it a ginjo. So just know these are minimum requirements that are not necessarily um, forced to call it that. So let me know if you have any questions on the labeling, we can talk about this a little bit later as we taste. How to taste at Tipsy. There's so many, um, we use this matrix that's uh, based on the density of the sake, how thick and thin the sake might be, including the alcohol and sugar levels and acidity and everything. 
just to make it simple, it's not a answer to everything, but we use a scale with SMV, which is called sake meter value, which is the density of the sake, and then acidity, um, which is a combination of like at least five different acids. So it gets kind of complicated, but we try to make it simple um, of, is it more rich? Is it more light? Is it more dry? Is it more sweet? Um, but honestly, sake has such a nuanced flavor. It's very difficult to kind of um, pin down. There's different glasses that you can enjoy this in. Um, I have like gifted, this is like really light bamboo one. Um, one thing I like to do is to have it like in a soy dish type of one. This is a, a flat, more flat one. And if you've been to a Japanese uh, wedding ceremony, they have the really, really flat ones that requires you to hold it with two hands that makes the woman look more demure is what I'm told. Um, but yes, holding it with two hands, kind of like, you know, like when you give a, uh, uh, your um, business card to somebody, you want to hold it with two hands when you give it to somebody to like show gratification. It's kind of like that too. But what it does for you taste wise is when it hits the side of your tongue at the same time, as opposed to a wine glass, which is going to like a cupped wine glass, which is going to concentrate the liquid into the middle of your tongue. It's a completely different sensation. So there are, um, there is a kaiseki restaurant in Japan that'll serve you the same sake for all of your seven courses in different temperatures and in different vessels. Because sake is such a sensual beverage and the tactile qualities, the temperatures, every five degrees Celsius is a different serving temperature for, for sake. That's another really great thing that you can experiment with. Um, all of those things really matter. And of course, your company and the occasion and how special um, that is. So these are just suggestions on how you might enjoy. Cheese goes really well with sake because cheese is also fermented. And a sake is really high on lactic acid compared to wine. So they marry really well. So pizza with sake, you might not think goes really well. It's actually a great marriage. Um, melted cheese, a little bit of salinity, like you really can't go wrong with that. And there's um, different varieties you can choose from. So don't be shy to try it with fried chicken and other dishes. Drinking etiquette. One main thing is that you wanna like fill others cups. That's like thinking of others um, before you think of yourself kind of thing, very Japanese thing. Um, and the gesture of pouring and it promotes conversation and caring for each other. Um, so I love that. Uh, the example on this slide, Mokiri, is kind of a modern, it's actually more modern invention, but some of you may have experienced this. You get it in a, um, in a masu, which is a box like this. This is actually one cup of rice. This is how people were taxed back, back in the day um, by rice. And this is one cup of sake, which is 180 cc or milliliter. And that's why one cup sake is that, um, that unit and when you see the wine size bottles, there's, those are 720 milliliter and that's four times 180. So it's still like going with a traditional um, measuring tactic. But the Mokiri style of serving is when you put a glass in a box and then you overflow it to show generosity um, and then you drink it and I would just pour the remaining in the glass um, and drink. But it's not so much an elegant way because it's a little messy, um, but it's definitely a fun way to enjoy it. And you might get it in like a, uh, more like a soy sauce plate looking thing in Japan if you had it like that. Um, I've never tried drinking it from the 
the flat side, but um, this was developed by another gentleman in Hawaii who's a super oyaji drinker, <laughs> just like me. So um, I'm gonna have to try it like that. Sometimes they put salt um, in the corners here. And then salt also always enhances this, the sweetness and kind of makes sake taste mild. So those are all really fun, fun times. But really, like this Japanese um, sense of omotenashi is about caring for others. And if you choose the vessel, if you're even thinking about which vessel is appropriate, that is what makes your time with others special. So um, I think that's just, that's what we should learn from the Japanese culture. Tasting, does everybody have a glass in front of them? Because I do. And we are going to start um, with the Gassai 45. Can you see the bottle? Which is on the screen. If you have that with you, please pour it in your, um, your favorite vessel. I, like I said, I have a you know, default wine, stemless wine glass that I drink out of um, for casual. I do like it in this one in a stem glass because it won't warm it up. And this is one that you wouldn't want to warm up. It's not really meant for warming up. Um, but let's uh, do a toast. Sorry, I talked for so much. Um, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do the stem wine glass. All right, and please show show off your, um, ooh, I love the, ooh, yeah, of course everybody has like their own special cup for it. And I see some wine glasses and I see some ceramics. And then Joel son has like, he has, a, yeah, the ceramic with the nice um, textures are nice. Let's see if I can, can I do this? Let's see everybody. Oh yeah, Yumiko san Tachi. They have like a more flat one, like you know, that touches the side. And then I think Yuko Kageyama Hanto san. It looks like a Kiriko glass. Those are very traditional, either from Tokyo or from Satsuma region in um, in Kyushu. And Sachi san, Sachi Road san, it has some nice ceramics as well. Biru san. And Brian Chia Yuini san has his sake glass. Everybody has them. Very cool. Thank you. I just, I'm a vessel person, so I like to do that. But um, cheers to everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Cheers. Kanpai des. Kanpai. A bite. Nice. Oh, Etsuko-san has like a nice um, Kiriko glass looking one too. Beautiful. There's some like places where you can make your own Kiriko. I did that for like $30 in Asakusa when I was there two years ago. You get to um, make your own, but really sake can be drank in any, any glass. It, it's, um, it does change the aromatics. This one is a very aromatic one. So you should get that floral sense to it. It's a highly polished rice, like I was talking about. The 45 means it's 45% rice polishing ratio. So that's 55% of the outside that is carved away. This is the same brand that was brought to the White House in 2016 by um, former Prime Minister Abe. It is from the prefecture that is um, his hometown, Yamaguchi Prefecture, it is a very innovative um, brewery that is also opening their own brewery in New York City for the Culinary Institute of Art, so CIA. Um, so they will be producing sake that is made in New York. They also have a storefront in Paris. Um, they're just very cool, innovative. Um, they just keep reinventing themselves. They were flooded, you know, um, like eight feet tall for like two years ago. They just bounced back. They became a leader in, in the region and um, money didn't matter to them. 
you know, it was, it was about kind of lifting up the community. And it's called Dasai. 45 is their new kind of normal go-to. They also have a 39, which means 61% of the polish uh, outside of the kernel is polished away. And 23 is a really famous one too, um, which means 77% of the outside is polished away. And then they have the Dasai Beyond, which is the one that was brought to the White House. Um, they don't like to tell you, but like usually 7% or so, it's a blend. They use the king of sake rice called the Yamadanishki. So this is a Daiginjo grade. So if you like this kind, if you're really enjoying it, and you like the, the, the softness of it, that might be the rice. Um, but if you like this fruity, floral, delicate, maybe you want to try Daiginjos from now on and see if there's some favorites. Um, it does cost a little bit more because, you know, it yields less and the, the rice kernels, as they get smaller, they're gonna be a lot harder um, to work with. So this is our first sake, I hope you enjoyed it. The second one has the little butterflies on them. It's called Nambu Bijing. Tokubetsu Junmai. So Junmai again means there's no brewer's alcohol added. Just because there's brewer's alcohol added doesn't make it a less premium sake. It's just a different style. Junmai tends to have a little bit more of more of the sake, uh, the rice flavor to it and a full flavor. If you did a Junmai tasting next to a non-Junmai tasting, there's a subtle texture difference. Junmai is going to be like whole milk compared to Honjozo, which is going to be like uh, skim milk. So Junmai has a little bit fuller rice flavor to it, and they tend to be okay to warm up a little bit as well. Now, this is the international wine competition winner which is in London, it's pretty big internationally. Um, it is an Iwate prefecture that suffered um, from the tsunami back in 2011. That's back when, when I, I was in Boston, we were devastated by it. And this brewery especially uh, worked with the community to really boost the sake uh, industry. So, Japanese culture again with the devastation they said okay we feel so bad about people who are suffering in the Tohoku region from this please abstain from partying drinking you know please respect others who are not able to enjoy the the um luxuries that you're able to enjoy and then the the president of this Nambu Beijing who's also in a movie called Kampai, um, he said, no, 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 no. Like he went on YouTube and said, please drink our beautiful sake. This is the only way that we are gonna survive. And this is what we need right now. We want you to enjoy our sake. And back then they just made a huge um, uh, facility for it. But back then there were only 10 people brewing this sake, this, you know, internationally acclaimed, like, sake for, and it's a famous brand, but you'll find that often where there's, like, 10 people, or even less, there's the husband and wife team making sake, and they're trying to keep the tradition alive, because it is, like I said, it's not a sustainable business, it is a dying art for a reason, and um, so, we love this brand because it's just iconic. And um, if you ever met the person, uh, Kuji-san, he's, he's really, his voice really carries, not like a typical Japanese person, he has a presence. So um, I hope you do meet him. He will go to Boston every once in a while um, because he does make it to New York and it's a really cool place. So I hope you're enjoying this one too. This can be um, my choice probably would be like a stemless wine glass because I like this one when it warms it up, warms up to room temperature. Um, I love the, the kind of the light citrus note 
that it has. Um, to me, it has more of a tangerine kind of note to it. It uses a race strain from Iwate Prefecture called Ging Otome. And um, I would take the recommended pairing with a grain of salt and really just try to pair it with anything you'd like. My first um, go-to might be like, you know, just because I'm inspired by the citrus notes, I might try to do like an orange glazed chicken or, you know, um, some popcorn with some spice or, uh, yeah. But um, you can warm this up gently. Um, when it doesn't have the word ginju, when it's not super highly polished, even though this is 55% and it says my, it's, it typically warms up well. Suchko, we have a question. Um, yes. In general, after opening, how long can it stay? And if you don't finish it, do I need to bring it back in the refrigerator? Yes, uh, please put it in the refrigerator. That's always a good idea. Um, you could use those like pumps, um, that you have to like suck out the air for wine if you'd like. It depends on the sake. All three that we're trying today are rather aromatic. So it will start to lose the aromatic qualities after a day or two. So my recommendation for this size especially would be to finish it within a few days. It's not that it will go bad though. So if you have it in the fridge for a week or two, you're still gonna be able to enjoy it. Maybe you'd enjoy it in a different way. Maybe it's not as aromatic. Maybe you'll try to warm it up a little bit or um, you can make cocktails. You can, you know, dilute it with soda. You don't, you know, if you feel like it's a, it's not your night to like have straight sake. Um, if something is too sweet for you, you could have it with a slice of citrus like a lemon or an orange. Um, and if it ever goes bad to a point where you don't feel like drinking it, put it in a bath or um, uh, use it in cooking. <laughs> like never, never, never waste it because it's amazing in a bath. Um, you can also use it as toner. Um, and so my colleague just use it as toner. <laughs> so there's many different ways to use it. Um, I wouldn't waste it, but it depends on the sake, but I would, even a bigger bottle, I try to finish it generally in a couple of weeks, but you know, of course I also have like Isho bean size, which is 1.8 liter Magnum size that I've had for months that won't fit in the fridge and I'll have it room temperature and it's still great. So it depends. Um, that's one way to get to know sake like, and that's the, that's the advantage of having it at home. You can't do this at the restaurant, but at home you can, you get to know it you know, at the intimate level. So um, please experiment as much as you can. I'm gonna go on to the last one. If there's no other questions. This is Kudoki Jozu. Um, some people like to translate that as sweet talker. It is from uh, Yamagata Prefecture which is the first prefecture that gained geographical indication. What that means is that, you know, Scotch whiskey can only be made in Scotland. Champagne can only be made in Champagne region. This Nihonshu or sake can only be made in Yamagata prefecture. They're the first prefecture that gained geographical indication for sake. They're known as the king of uh, the land of Ginjo, which is highly polished rice, kind of aromatic kind of sake. So it's a very rural area. And it's funny because uh, the founder of Tipsy, Genki-san, he fought for this sake to still be available in America. He worked for a, a Japanese importer and distribution company for 10 years and they were gonna discontinue this. And he said, no, this is the reason why I love sake. You can't discontinue this. And it's a fairly famous brand in Japan, but there's no way to get a hold of them. They still want orders through a fax machine. So we have not been able to have, you know, direct contact with them, but we love their sake and we know they're in a rural area. And if you've traveled around Japan 
before you'll know that in these areas, you know that like everything is kind of analog still. You can't book, you know, things online. You have to call them. Everything is cash. You, it was very difficult for me to, um, it was challenging for me to, to visit a lot of breweries when I went um, because everything is analog and I don't know if there's going to be taxis. There's no Ubers and um, everything is cash. And I, I'm just an American. I don't know anything. <laughs> but this one um, I would enjoy also in a wine glass because the cup shape of the wine glass is going to concentrate that, that nice apple-y aroma, like a green apple. And again, this can only be done with highly polished rice. This one is 50%. So it qualifies for a daiginjo, but they call it a ginjo, which is a lower grade. Um, because they don't want to make it too expensive for you. They want you to enjoy it um, a little bit more casually. It's light. Um, it does have a sweeter component to it. Um, in the aroma, and it's also made from a famous rice strain called Miyamanishiki that originated in Nagano Prefecture. So um, this one is was a surprise for me because it's very affordable and um, has a very elegant taste to it as well. So that concludes our tasting. If there's any questions, I'm here. Yes, such a one question. Um, uh, from our audience, where does the sweetness in Kudoki Jozu come from? It feels so, very sweet. Yeah, all the sweetness is from the rice to sugar conversion with the use of the koji. So everything is natural. The aromatics actually really matter to your perception of sweetness. So when you have whiskey or, you know, other like hard liquor, there's no, there's absolutely no sugar in hard liquor, right? But they, people still describe like caramely and chocolatey and it's, it's similar to that, but the nose on this, the sweet aromatic comes from the yeast. So the yeast is like 80 to 90% responsible for the aroma and the way that they do it is with slow, low temperature fermentation which has to happen with a very skilled um, labor. So, uh, yes. Sorry, one more question. Is sake ever made from koshikari rice? Koshikari? Yes, the ones that we eat. Yes, yeah, it can be. Um, sometimes there's a combination of rice that they use. So for the koji, they'll use rice strain. And then for the kakemai they call, which is the steamed rice that they add, they'll use a different rice strain. Um, only 1% of the entire rice production in Japan is sake rice. And 4% is table rice that is used for sake. So only 5% of the entire rice production in Japan is used for sake. And then even further than that, you know, 20% um, of the whole rice that's used for sake making is used with sake rice, is made with sake rice. But you have to take into consideration that in Japan, most of the sake, there's 70, over 70% 70 of sake made in Japan is ta like table sake grade and not premium sake grade. So at Tipsy, we have everything that is premium sake because we don't have the, the gallon sized boxes that you would, you know, go onto a sake machine or some of the cooking rice, but that still is a major part in Japan of what they make. So table rice is used mostly for those. Interesting. One last question for you, Sachiko. Um, when you said sake can be used for toner, what oh, yeah. uh, that your your colleague uses for toner, like literally, as in you know, yeah. I wash my face 
I just take a cotton and like, or like put it in a spray bottle. Uh, um, it might get a little bit sticky at first. Do you dilute it or do you just use it as is? Just use it as is, as is. honestly, like diluting it. The water in America, even though I think water in Boston is still very clean, but the water in um, California has to be filtered pretty heavily. I, I personally would not want to add water to it, but I understand um, it, it shouldn't, it wouldn't hurt. Um, but it makes it, it makes it a little bit mochi mochi and like sticky in the beginning, but it'll, it'll absorb, um, it should absorb just fine. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sachiko. I, um, like I said, I've never met uh, Jack, your son, but from what I'm hearing, Keiko-san, I think Jackson would be happy. I think so too. And he will be enjoying all this three seconds tonight. Yes, I, I almost feel like I almost feel like he's here with us and enjoying yes. it. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, congratulations, Deborah. Congratulations, the Japan Festival of Boston uh, Committee. Um, it is a honor for us to uh, welcome you here and to to award you this uh, this very important award. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for joining us. I hope tonight was a beautiful reminder of how each and every one of our friendship and our commitment to the U.S.-Japan relationship matters and how as a community of bridge builders, we can make a difference and enrich our lives. Thank you, Boston Japan Festival Committee. And thank you, Deborah Samuels for being such great role models of that. So with that said, thank you. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. And I hope you uh, can join us in our future programming. And for those of you who had the sake and for those of you who didn't have the sake, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.